Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Syed. I will continue with this uh, more um, a second part of my talk. So, hemodynamic monitoring of sepsis AD. Uh, I think there is a lot of way, uh, more than 100 way of how to monitor a, a patient uh, sepsis, especially if they are non-invasive, invasive, yeah? But before that, I want to introduce some of the basic concepts of resuscitation. So, what is shock? Shock means that there's perfusion that uh, uh, we have poor perfusion toward all the tissue, yeah? poor perfusion to tissue. Yeah? So, uh, I divide shock into three states. Yeah? Uh, so, the normal state, sepsis is considered as like a compensated sick shock or cellular shock, and septic shock is already decompensated or systemic shock. I put this this way because it's easy for us to make it conceptual. However, I want to highlight this. Septic shock is very complex and it's usually presented with a combination of hypovolemic shock, distributed shock, which is we know, well known of septic shock, cardiogenic shock, and sometimes obstructive shock. Why is it so? Because septic shock usually patient pro-orientate, and uh, uh, high in, uh, insensible loss, and cause hypovolemia. Distributed shock is what, what, what was so tragic caused by the cytokine. Cardiogenic shock is due to the pathogen caused uh, cardiomyopathy, or even uh, the cytokine that can cause some high cardio cardiomyopathy. Obstructive shock can be due to the pericardial effusion, can be due to period effusion, can be due to uh, abdomen, abdomen ascites that spin the chest. So all these actually contribute to septic shock. Septic shock is not only distributed shock. This is what I want to highlight now. So decompensated shock, most likely you can see in a systemic uh, vital sign, um, uh, you can see a poor, uh, the heart rate is high, low urine output, high lactate, low basic access, respiratory rate more than 22. So this is a uh, more to our general shock, which is defined by, uh, we can see uh, BP low, doctor, uh, the heart rate is low. Uh, so this is uh, a very classical, uh, classical shock. But compensation shock is where we miss. Uh, we always miss the compensation shock. So it, patient can may look normal, talk to you. Uh, heart rate can be normal, can be in the, in, in, the, in the between normal and not normal range. Heart, uh, 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 the pulse narrow, pulse pressure can be narrow, not or white or normal. Yeah, in a septic shock, definitely white, white pulse pressure, right? Lactic can be low, can be normal, and everything look normal. However, the telltale sign is respiratory rate. Yeah? Respiratory rate and also base access. These two will give you very, very clear about the patient's cellular shock. The respiratory rate is a metabolic component. I repeat again, respiratory rate is the metabolic component of the vital sign. Heart rate, BP is more to the systemic component, but respiratory rate is uh, metabolic component. Why I say so? Because acidosis causes respiratory rate increase. Lachemic is due to respect, uh, our metabolism, metabolic, eh? uh, metabolic acidosis. The base excess also give you a blood. Eh? blood. Uh, this is ne negative 2 is not good. Negative 2 is very acid acidemia. It, this is the metabolic component of our blood. If the base excess you use this, uh, in any, any, any blood you can use the base excess. Uh, if negative 2 is acidosis, it's also considered as cellular or metabolic uh, acidosis. The pH will give you a false, a very false uh, information if you didn't look carefully on this few uh, parameters. ABG can give you a compensated acidosis, the pH itself, you know. So I want you, I hope that you can see these two parameters. And this is the only vital sign. If you don't have any ABG or any mortality to monitor patient, respiratory rate is the best monitoring tool uh, for either your res uh, our, our resuscitation is good or not good. Yeah? Okay, I just an interesting fact. Uh, this is very basic concept. Narrow pulse pressure indicate hypovolemia. Why is pulse pressure indicate perfusion problem? Because we need a white pulse pressure to get the oxygen, uh, 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 to, to, to get the hyperperfusion, yeah? Good perfusion. And low base excess means acidemia in plasma. Respiratory rate, very sensitive to acidemia. That's why it is compensated subtly. So if you, you know that we have this big four, we usually don't monitor the respiratory rate because respiratory rate, there's no machine to count the respiratory rate. We need to count manually. Now, today, we rely so much on the machine that we, we might uh, overlook uh, respiratory rate uh, calculation. Yeah? And urine output. Urine output uh, is the one we, that we use. But however, because we, so, uh, we need to use hourly uh, to gauge the patient. If let's say you have urine output like 0.5, it's indicate patient global hypo. If, uh, if you don't have, let's say, sorry. If you don't have any sophisticated machine, I suggest you to use a narrow pulse, the pulse pressure to help you, respiratory to help you, respiratory to help you, and also you have to help you 
to monitor a patient whether it's in a shock state, a compensated state, or patient going back to normal. So advanced hemodynamic monitoring in sepsis. Okay. So just now we have introduced this chart again. I will go into a more details. So I put this oxygen delivery here, I highlight this thing, because everybody will look into uh, the cardiac output, talk about the oxygenation that on, in the blood that's sent to the cell. However, there is still few components, um, you see here, cardiac output, the arterial oxygen content like hemoglobin, SAO2, and PaO2. However, there's still, still got a few more components, which is our hormones uh, our, uh, and our glucose of ATP. Yeah? This is all in full picture of the full picture of the resuscitation. But now I want to concentrate here first, yeah, the systemic. I talk about stroke volume and also the cardiac output. Stroke volume. Stroke volume is something like we call arterial volume. Okay, which component of volume is, does matter for resuscitation? It's more to the arterial components of volume. The venous component of volume is more to reserve. So that the active component of resuscitation is the, for, uh, pertaining to volume is how much the fluid inside the artery uh, is better. Yeah? So, however, we don't have a very good modality to much measure the stroke volume in a limited resources setting. In a high, high income country, definitely there's so much of invasive way to monitor even the echo machine in the emergency department can give us this, you know, to assess the stroke volume by using the LVOT, VTI, um, but however, not everybody knows this how to do it. And we had this, you know, Kevin index, the CVP, uh, to measure the venous return in the IVC. However, this modality also indirectly measured the vein, uh, inferior vena cava volume. Remember, not all volume from the inferior vena cava will travel into the aorta because we have lung. Our lung is pathological. The venous return that go into the right heart doesn't translate into the left heart. Even we have heart failure, the right heart, the inferior vena cava volume will not go to aorta. So to measure the volume using the venous, uh, our cable index or CBP, definitely there is some pick for. You have to be a normal physiology patient, uh, one to one, like a renal return to 100% go to stroke volume. That type of patient condition, only we can use this. So uh, stroke volume, if you don't know, stroke volume is determined by the preload, preload is venous return, and also afterload, which is our stroke volume or our PPR, our systemic vascular resistance and contracting the heart. And stroke volume affected by preload, affect by, uh, the preload more, stroke volume more, afterload more, stroke volume low, inotropic, uh, the stroke volume will be high. Uh, so the stroke volume times the heart, heart rate will give you the cardiac output. So this is anatomy, what I'm talking about just now. Usually the IVC, we measure our volume here. Use the CVP, this is vein, this is right heart, this is left heart, this is the lung, this is pulmonary artery, this is pulmonary vein, this is aorta. Usually what we monitor in our current uh, non-invasive way of monitoring is monitoring this, uh, this part. However, the more precise is to me measure the aorta heart. However, when we, what, uh, what I'm talking about is when this volume go into the heart, go into the lung, by right, by theoretically, should hundred percent go into the uh, pulmonary vein and go into artery. However, there is also a compounder factor, which is the cardiac failure of the lung, the lung resistance, uh, and also ventilation. So now I want to go into more uh, fundamental, which is starting force. Starting law very easy. How much of volume go into the heart? Stretch the cardiac muscle. The longer you stretch, the harder they pump the more short volume. So it means that your anti-stolic volume go into the heart, stretch more, more volume, stretch more, more short volume out. Simple, right? So venous return, if you have dehydration, we have dehydration, venous return reduce, then the stroke volume will reduce, correct or not? Because low volume, low stroke volume. This is a chart versus the, this is LVEDP. Okay, don't let this term make you uh, scared about. Just think of cardiac contractility, very simple cardiac contractility. The higher contractility with higher volume, right? Starting law always say that. More volume, more stretch of cardiac muscle, more pressure. Less volume, less pressure. Simple. So however, this graph is very dynamic. It can shift up, can shift down. How, what condition, this red dotted line is normal, normal, normal function cardiac, normal volume. However, in what condition can move this chart go down and this chart go up? Let me share with you. So, if your normal condition, not shock, whatever, we will follow this chart. However, when we had uh, hyperemic, hyperdynamic, like cytokine storm, 
we have sepsis, we have inotropic effect like we start inotropic, or patient in a thyroid storm, or patient have a SLE flare, a rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they become a hyperdynamic circulation. This, this graph will shift to the left. Why? Because the volume will go in very fast. The changes of volume very fast because of the heat and the sudden loss, and this go higher and higher. So to later on, I will say why we need to know this um, graph push up or this graph push down, shift to the right, shift to the right because of the cardiac contractility, because of the low ATP, because of the hypoglycemia, because there's no energy to power, uh, to, to to react, and also lack of hormones uh, and it causes the cardiac function that low. low. So this is very simple. Frank starting curve gives you a lot, a lot of information. Currently, you can have a look. Uh, there's a lot of uh, way of monitoring the, um, the fluid status. Yeah? How the fluid status relate to this chart. Look, look at this chart. Yeah? This is a normal patient, normal cardiac function, normal volume, normal patient. Normal patient yeah? So however, when the patient dehydration, the curve dehydration will go down. You see, this is not a linear. This is a curve, palabola. Eh? So the lower volume, it goes, the changes of volume can change the BP abruptly. Yeah? Little bit changes of volume in this area will give you a changes of BP very abruptly. However, when you go up to the higher, it means that the volume is almost, uh, almost uh, full or almost uh, adequate. It will give you a less changes of the volume toward our BP. Yeah? However, if this patient got cardiac failure, in this chart, you see, this chart, the changes here is less than the changes in normal patient because the cardiac function is not good. It didn't tell you, that's why when you give a little bit of fluid, uh, the BP won't change much in the cardiac failure patient. But however, in normal patient, you give a little bit of fluid, it will increase, and it will cause a, a good rate in uh, improve of the BP, but this one not. And it also achieve, uh, it achieve a, a, a look, achieve a plateau like you uh, stroke volume because the cardiac function is not good and the, and these changes of volume doesn't change much of the BP. So this is whereby you have to look into the chart on this graph. Um, uh, traditionally, there is uh, art line, arterial line. I think here a lot, some of you have used arterial line before. Uh, we, they mentioned, they, they, they use this a pulse pressure variability. It means that you look in your machine, there's a pulse like this. Then uh, pulse from the art line, so this amplitude, changes of amplitude, which we tally with our graph here. Let's see. You see, when the patient have low volume, meaning the patient not enough fluid, not enough fluid, let's say here, here. If you go give a bolus of fluid, you push the patient to this here, right? So the change, so when this change, when you put here, and then volume is here, the changes uh, around this area and changes around this area is compared to each other, this is higher changes, this is less changes, right? So it reflects to the length of this pulse. The length of this pulse is actually the tangent of this. All right? So if let's say, the sorry, the changes, sorry, this tangent is the changes of this long length, this, this pulse minus this minimum. The minimum is here. The, 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 the longest is here. So if you have a difference between these two, it's this length. So if you have a changes of very big changes, like this divide to this, this minus this and divide into two, actually we can tell you that the patient is in this graph, this area. The fluid status is in this area. If you see this graph, you know already the patient is hypovolemia. Very simple. And you give fluid, and then this chart will, you see, the wavy, long, short, long, short, long, short. But now after you give boluses, maybe you push the patient back to this chart here already, the short volume, sorry. Go back. You go to this area. Then now there's no changes much. So you see the peak is not changes much. This is very simple monitoring, eyeballing. You just look into the arterial wave line, uh, wave line and you can see the changes and no changes can tell you the patient's fluid status. And this variability can be, in, uh, can be enhanced, uh, uh, eccentric, uh, uh, variable with our, uh, our respiratory cycle. When when we expired, uh, uh, when we inspired, uh, uh, in Malay, it's called tarik nafas, eh? tarik nafas, inspired. So when you pull, pull our chest uh, volume increase, then our venous return increase, right? To, uh, uh, and exponential increase. When you have more venous return, then you will have a longer wave. When you up to the maximum of volume, 
meaning that your, target, your pressure on the thoracic is high enough to maximum, your venous return should be the maximum. So it gives you the stroke volume, nice stroke volume, a maximum stroke volume. But in, in between the inspiration, the, the stroke volume every time change because it's increased, increased stroke volume because you pull in from the chest, from the inferior vena cava when you take a deep breath, yeah? However, when you expired, expired, meaning say throw, throw away the air, the volume will come back to the original volume. So you go down again. So you will see this like a, a sinusoidal wave here. Yeah? So this is in the art line, it's invasive, but it's very information. Area under this line actually is stroke volume. It's the same concept. So now using the Frank Starling curve, you will know that if patient dehydration is here, more than 10% in the patient with ventilated patient, using the art line in the very normal, in the peak of uh, uh, zero to three, and then you have to make sure the patient is uh, under the sedative condition, you can use this theory. This is more than 10% changes. Meaning that the, the length, the length of the tallest one and the shortest one, you minus and you see the percentage different, more than 10% meaning that patient need more boluses until you have less than 10%. Yeah, this is called SBV. So can the pulse oximeter, uh, pulse oximeter can give a similar information like artery line. Uh, this is a big thing that, this is something that we look into. Pulse oximeter is available in everywhere, right? Everywhere. Uh, artery, artery line is not easy to obtain. Eh? Not, not everybody can have this facility to monitor. So this study look into this pulse oximeter wave. Can it compare with arterial line wave? And we found it's only 12 ventilated patient in the 10 patient is actually was drained up 10 10% uh, of blood drain passively 10 minutes and then is in this tidal volume setting in 10 rate is 8 to 10 and all uh, EDC uh, and tidal side uh, CO2 is this after five minutes they measure the all parameter and then they give back the and then they give back the volume by using the HEMA cell and then later on they transfer after the surgery so you see you can see this is artery artery from art line the wave is like this because they make it fast, 0 uh, 6.25 speed, it look like this, yeah? And you see the pulse oximeter is similar waveform, yeah? So it's comparable, actually, comparable. So uh, after they give volume, uh, no, they want to tell you, after they, uh, in a hypovolemic state, when we have respiration, it will have eccentric this situation, yeah? For this pulse oximeter, for the patient who are on pulse oximeter, also same, eccentric, and when you stop at near, actually patient have to get back to the baseline. So conclusion, a uh, pulse oximeter correlate with artery waveform. And uh, we also talk about PVI and also POP. POP is the pulse oximeter wave, like just now I talked about the pulse. But after now, a lot of machine convert this P pulse oximeter wave information and convert into PVI, a reading, eh? a reading on electric currency, eh? electric current. So these two, they want to see whether compare with other modality uh, to mon monitor the fluid status, the fluid status, is that okay or not? So this protocol also have 25 patients and then they ventilate in the same setting. And then uh, they, they found out that uh, this is the formula that they use for, uh, for POP. POP means that you use a pulse oximeter tracing and then you use the longest minus the shortest uh, and over the this uh, P max plus P minus uh, P minimum by two time percentage. And PVI is the electronic uh, calculation for you in a machine that gives you P max P minimum. Okay, so after that, um, and this is the result like you see, the black variability and perfusion index is uh, responder is like this and non-responder is this, yeah? So what happened is that uh, you can see PVO, the, for the POP, this is uh, area under the curve is 0 0.944. The PVI, the area under the curve is 0 0.927. So the, the cutoff is 12% changes and the cutoff for PVI 40%. So conclusion, we get the PVI of more than 14%. Meaning that if you see the machine got 14% changes, uh, patient actually is need fluid. If you have a delta POP more than 12% in a ventilated patient, patient need fluid. For POP and PVI in a spontaneous breathing, can we use in a non-ventilated patient? Yes, this test, this study is actually talking about. It's talking about this. Uh, so this patient was using the passive leg raise to get uh, to replace the fluid boluses, and the conclusion is that the passive leg raising actually can increase about 500 mils of fluid go back to the venous return 
and they found out that the cutoff of 15%, 15% of POP, meaning that the changes of POP, 15% can give you a very good uh, prediction of hypervolumen in a spontaneous breathing patient. And this also, another study for a spontaneous breathing patient using the PVI, eh? just how I said the index, and it gives a similar result, which is uh, PVI value more than 19% is significant to indicate that there is a volume problem. So the specificity is quite low, but it's still user, useful. Yeah? Now, um, uh, this, uh, so I conclude in here is that if you have a pulse on speaker, you look into the waveform in a spontaneous patient. If the waveform is normal homogeneous, the that patient is normal volume. If the patient has this type of waveform like this, this way, the patient is hypervolumic shock. It's more to hypervolumic. The waveform has to be more than 15%, yeah? The changes of here and here. And for the cardiogenic, actually, you can see the pulse wave is not touching the baseline. And it's small wave and no wavy, not like this, but it's a homogeneous small wave. It's more to cardiogenic as well as some hormone issues and also ATP issue, yeah? And for vasoplegic, patient actually have vasodilatation. The pulse of the will give you an overshoot, yeah? overshoot wave that's touching overshoot the baseline. This is considered vasoplegic. Uh, Actually, in what condition will have this vasoplegic situation? Hypertension, hyperdynamic situation, septic shock patient with good volume. Yeah? For cardiogenic, uh, uh, so this is how I use a pulse oximeter to use an eye bowling, uh, as an eye bowling, uh, for you to determine whether patient currently is hypervolumic or not, currently is cardiogenic or not, or currently is vasoplegic or not. Yeah? So this is uh, simple. So based on the Starting curve is also explained this hypovolemia. When you, the cross is here, you will see the wavy form, as I, what I mentioned just now. When uh, that's why, if you have a wavy form, patient is in uh, this area, the dot is here. If the patient muscle dilatation, you see is overshooting. The dotted line, dotted line here, the blue color dotted line, actually comparable to this red line dotted line. Yeah? So, if let's say overshoot means that patient have muscle plagic, is following this curve. Yeah. Muscle dilatation is there. Muscle dilatation is there. So if your vital dilation is hyperdynamic, so that is following this curve. When the patient have this curve, you have to think of whether you want to start NSA early or not. Yeah? Or start not early if let's say we below. Hemodynamic stable patient have a normal wave and cardiogenic depression actually is following this road. You see the green color, green color wave actually is very short amplitude. It's according to this amplitude as well, the green color tube. So if you see a shorter amplitude, meaning that patient has cardiogenic problem. Yeah? So the, you see this orange color, orange color uh, cursor is similar to this orange color. If it's cross, this, this length is cross this line, it's overshoot, it's muscle dilatation. For volume, have these significant changes, yeah? Okay, so this is a conclusion for all study. You might need to know that the changes of POP for spontaneous breathing patient is, uh, this is cut off, this is cut off, 15 and 19, and for ventilator patient, 12 and 14, yeah? So this is some of the picture that I took from a patient from a cardiac monitor. This is a normal volume patient. You can see the, the waveform is very nicely. This is on the 6.25 millimeter per second setting. For a patient with valve dehydration, but patient have hypertension, you can see the pulse oscillator and art light actually have some of the overshooting here. Overshooting here, touching the baseline. But for the volume, uh, patients have a moderate and severe dehydration and vasoplegic shock. Patient got volume issues, which is you can see the wavy, and also you can see this is a vasodilatation here. Vasodilatation here, yeah. Uh, so, so this is a combination of vasodilatation and also hypovolemic that give the blood pressure low. You can give fluid and you can start no at early. And this is vasodilatation alone with a good with a very good uh, hydration. You can see the pulse pressure is wide, and but you see the wave is touching the baseline. So this is only purely vasodilatation. So this patient no need any fluid anymore, but you can give the no air if let's say the blood pressure is low. And this patient have a very sharp uh, amplitude. You can see it's very sharp amplitude and BP is bit, uh, not very wide pressure. So this is a cardiogenic depression. Maybe this patient need to have some dobutamine to support the heart contractility to get back the normal size. However, this will need to replace the fluid first, meaning because some of the patient have, you can see some of the wave here is wavy. So meaning the patient has some little bit of uh, vasodilate, uh, sorry, some hypovolemia. You have to give some fluid first, and then you see whether it's expanded. If the fluid is optimum already, then it's the time whereby you have to start your dopamine, which is a low dose enough, yeah? 
So this is the combination of hypovolemic and cardiogenic depression. As I mentioned, you can see the wave is a bit more in that you can see. And patient actually have got AF. You can see the wave is a bit irregular, but however, you can see this is the wavy here. So it's follow the respiratory. So this patient have two conditions. One is the volume depression, and also number two, patient have cardiac depression. Very simple. Yeah. So, so what I want to say is that um, I want to convince you that if you see this type of pattern, you have to think about whether patient's volume problem or cardiogenic problem. Yeah, then you can start something. For this also small wave can be due to hydrocort depletion or our cortisol depression, our hypoglycemic, because hypoglycemic, all agent, all our body cannot respond, that it will not give you a good wave. The perfusion to the finger not good, the amplitude is low, lower. If you're really optimum, our cardiac, optimum our fluid, optimum the cardiac compression, uh, cardiac contractility, which is already reached 10 mili micro, uh, 10 mic per kilo per minute of vitamin, maybe you have to consider the hormones part. So that's why I say, if you have already start patient BP low, you have hypovolemic, correct the hypovolemic first. If the hypovolemic is almost corrected, which is the size of the, uh, our platymographic is almost homogeneous, but it's still small wave, then you have to start with dopamine, which is maximum of uh, zero point, uh, maximum of uh, 10 mic per kilo per minute. Yeah? No S, maximum is 0 0.3. Then after that, if this two is optimum already, uh, zero point three is started no at, and then also five to ten mic, uh, ten mic of double vitamin already started, then you have to consider hormone. You have to consider the sugar, because if the wave is still like this, it means that the hormone and sugar actually the, is the culprit that caused the picking not picking up and the patient perfusion not good. So that time you have to challenge with the dextrose, uh, initiate the insulin infusion. So I have created this another chart of here, another part of the chart. So what you do is that you need to just look into the pulse oximeter and then you check on this patient here. After you have determined this sepsis, you check on here. And then after you check all this lymphocyte count, albumin count. And then you put a cross on this chart, yeah? first dot, yeah? first dot, and see whether which patient, current patient state is which state. Yeah? It's either is hypovolemia or hyper, hyperinflammation, hyperinflammation, cardiogenic shock, the cross first. After you initiate hour, one hour bundle, then you check back after one hour. If let's say you plot again and patient by the sign go back to normalize or come back here, then you continue another one three hours monitoring and then you cross again. If let's say you can go back the cross, come back to here, from here, cross to here, means that you successfully sus the patient. So you can see here hormone insufficiency, insufficiency and malnourished is there by you suspect, yeah? Suspect, you suspect, yeah. So now uh, take home message, smaller amplitude, POP. Is, uh, can be low cardiac output vessel contraction, which is patient hypovolemia as well. And also long amplitude of POP can be a uh, uh, vasodilatory hyperdynamic circulation over inotropic and hypertension. And also for the spontaneous breathing patient, uh, uh, the POP should be 15. Uh, POP, delta POP should be 15 and the delta PVI is 19. And also for the ventilated patient, uh, the changes of POP is more than 12 and also uh, 14 is considered hypovolemic shock. Yeah? And this is the final chart that I want to show to you again. Uh, this is normal hemodynamic curve and anotropic curve and also contractility and hypoglycemic curve or low LDP, uh, ATP curve. 